Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce one of our own, Dr. Ross Baldessarini. Many of you probably know him. For those who don't, he is a fully tenured professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at Harvard Medical School. Um, he spent the bulk of his career here at McLean Hospital, but he's also a senior consulting psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital. He was the founding director of our bipolar and psychotic disorders program here at McLean Hospital. He also founded the International Consortium for Mood and Psychotic Disorders Research, uh, working with colleagues from the Americas, Europe, and Asia. He is an internationally known neuroscientist and research psychopharmacologist. He's made many contributions related to the basic scientific understanding of central monoaminergic systems, their involvement in pathophysiology and neuro of neuropsychiatric disorders, and the actions of antipsychotic and mood stabilizing medications. He has over 2,200 publications, um, and I'm going to stop there. He has in, uh, other innumerable awards and honors and distinctions, but he is going to speak with us today on suicide rates and risk factors in major mood disorders and post-hospital discharge. Please join me in giving me a warm welcome to Dr. Baldus Rini. Thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to still be here. <laughs> and I must say this is a very peculiar way to celebrate Valentine's Day, but I'm going to be uh, De dealing with a uh, fairly downbeat topic, and that is about uh, to remind us all that many of our illnesses in psychiatry, in fact, have mortality rates that go with them. And I guess the most, uh, the best known part of the story is suicide, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But in addition, I've been doing a lot of reading and writing in the last six months or so on the uh, broader problem of, of mortality, uh, with, especially with, with major mood disorders. The uh, rates of heart attacks, strokes, and a whole lot of other problems are enormous. And in fact, if you count dead people at the end of a year who have mood disorders, there are about as many who have died in excess from medical illnesses as there are from suicide. Suicide is mostly uh, something for younger people and the other things happen uh, later in life. But in general, the whole uh, topic of, of mortality in our illnesses is a, is a big one that I think has really not been given enough attention. I wanted to uh, introduce the uh, folks who helped with the work I'm presenting today. It is work that comes out of this international consortium on uh, mostly on bipolar disorder, but on psychotic illnesses in general. And there are people who come from all sorts of places. And in, in this particular uh, project, uh, one of the uh, studies on after discharge suicide risk was done with Alberto Forte, who's at the University of Rome. Uh, Leonardo Tondo is involved, and he uh, is a longtime collaborator, has a McLean appointment, and uh, comes here several times a year and leads a uh, mood disorder center in Sardinia, named for the person who should get credit for inventing ECT, Lucio Bini, uh, although his elder uh, professor, uh, Ugo Cerletti, usually gets more credit than he deserves. But Bini, I can tell you, did the work and should get the credit. Uh, Nick uh, Nunez is a resident in uh, Ontario, who's been working with us. And finally, Gustavo Vasquez is from Argentina, but is currently working at Queen's University in Ontario uh, as a visiting scholar. I also, while I'm here, wanted to make mention of some other uh, characters from McLean uh, who are actually uh, behind the scenes, I think, have encouraged uh, this presentation. Uh, Fernando Rodriguez Villa, Mark Robart, Arthur Siegel and Doug Jacobs have all had a hand uh, in encouraging the work. Um, Mark and Fernando, uh, it should be noted, are really getting quite interested in, in suicide uh, as a clinical challenge for sure. Uh, 
but also as, a, as an educational opportunity, including the invention this year of a new uh, fellowship uh, in suicide. And I think it's, it's high time that uh, more formal attention be brought to the problem. And as far as disclosures, I can tell you uh, at long last I am an honest person and uh, have given up my wayward uh, ways. Again, the point uh, I started out with that I'll say again is that uh, mortality is a really big issue in psychiatry and one that's been ignored and underappreciated, I think, for a long time. Suicide is certainly a big part of it. Suicide is really uh, uh, a young person's big problem. It happens later, but uh, is particularly a problem in young people. And medical problems, especially those that seem to be relatively stress sensitive, especially cardiovascular, pulmonary, uh, neurovascular, and other conditions, have uh, increased rates, uh, but not as big as the relative increase in risk of suicide. The standard mortality rate, which is the ratio of risk in a given population divided by the general population, is maybe 20-fold elevated for suicide and only two or three-fold elevated for medical uh, excess mortality. But because there are so many more older persons, the number of dead people at the end of the year is actually very similar uh, from medical causes and from suicide. There's also mortality that's related to things that are sometimes called accidents, uh, and we know what some of them really are. Uh, and then the complications of substance abuse and substance abuse is another part of the uh, story that I want to get into. Yeah, this again, this is a favorite old study from Sweden by Osby and his colleagues. And it makes the point that if you tote up the uh, number of deaths per year from violent uh, causes, including suicide, accidents, and so on, and compare that to excess medically related deaths, the numbers are actually remarkably similar. And I think that because the relative risk in suicide is so much bigger, uh, it's sort of a flashier and more attractive problem. But uh, uh, I think that we really need to be spending much more time trying to understand this excess of medical-based uh, excess mortality, which we still don't really understand very well. This is another thing that's, that's set off basically by a kind of a, an academic quibble. Um, it's because I don't like a word that I hear often called suicidality. And I, I, I came to dislike suicidality some years ago when the FDA was on its witch hunt about SSRI drugs killing little kids. Uh, because of excess suicide risk. Most of that story has turned out to be probably largely a bogus story, uh, it, but it's complicated. I mean, there, there's, there's a kernel of important clinical truth in it in that we've known for a long time that antidepressants can increase suicidal risk uh, in all ages, all kinds of antidepressants. It's not just about SSRIs and kids. I think it has to do with a type of vulnerability that gets you into a state of what I call misery combined with energy. And that's lethal. And what I'm talking about are what we fashionably now refer to as mixed states, depression with hypomanic features, that kind of thing, or agitated depression. There's a whole range of conditions, and sometimes people who are constructed that way and that can move in that direction when given an antidepressant can become agitated and more suicidal than before. And this is a particular uh, thing to be worried about early in treatment with somebody that you don't know yet. You really need to watch like a hawk in the first few weeks. Anyway, what lies behind suicidality, and the reason I got bent out of shape with the FDA witch hunt, is that with the kids and the SSRIs, most of what they're talking about were bad thoughts. And you know, bad, thinking about 
wish I were dead or I want to hurt myself is a very, very elusive, difficult thing to measure with any kind of confidence. And so the, the numbers in the general population about uh, how many people think about suicide in a given year, those are very soft but very large numbers and they're in the thousands per year per 100,000. Suicide attempts, on the other hand, are maybe 30, 40 fold less prevalent, and they're in the hundreds of persons per 100,000 per year. And suicide itself is in, in the below 200 fold less than the number of people with suicidal thinking. So it's important when you, when you use a loose term like suicidality, it's better to refer more specifically, what are you talking about? Is it thoughts? Is it preparatory behaviors? Is it, a, is it gestures? Is it real attempts with intent to die? Uh, what is it? Another way of looking at this uh, problem is in this Venn diagram that I put together from data uh, produced by the NIMH uh, last, uh, la actually last year. And in this Venn diagram, ideation is a common thing, planning uh, and preparation uh, much less, and actual attempts with some intent to die much, much less, uh, probably uh, uh, less than one two hundredth. And then this little black dot is the suicides. <clears throat> and, and, and the point of this is to keep in mind that when you throw around a loose term like suicidality, and you're talking mostly about bad thoughts or maybe mild attempts, you, you can really scare the hell out of people and make a, a, a big fuss about something that can be quite misleading. And I think that's one of the things that came out of the FDA's efforts about the uh, antidepressants in kids, uh, that we, we are talking about mostly about thinking, occasional maybe, self-injurious uh, acts. And in the entire tens of thousands of kids that were looked at by the FDA, you know how many dead kids there were? None. I think the point is made. So let me get into some of the nitty gritty about suicide in the United States. A few years ago when we started getting interested in this problem, I was shocked to find out where it happens. Uh, naively, I thought, got to be on the coast. Got to be uh, places like New York and certainly California. Not true. It's in the middle of the country and particularly in the least inhabited parts of the country. So the inner mountain southwest and the very highest risks are in Alaska. And if you look among the native uh, Inuit populations in Alaska, the rates of suicide are among the highest in the world. There's a lot of social breakdown and, and uh, cultural breakdown, a lot of drinking, a lot of other problems that go with it. But it, the, the rates in Alaska generally, and particularly uh, among the northern Inuit populations, is astounding. Uh, and in fact, places like California and the East Coast are relatively low, and one of the remarkably lowest places in the country, hard to believe, Washington, D.C. <laughs> that may change. <laughs> Let me tell you some more bad news, and one of the reasons for wanting to give the presentation today is that the risk of suicide in this country has been rising, rising, rising over the last several decades. And these are some recent uh, uh, CDC data that came out last year, sh oops, showing you the rate of uh, rise of suicides in the general population for all parts of the country, all ages, all ethnic groups, and so on. And this is a, a dramatic increase. I mean, going from a little over 10, uh, 10 years ago to pushing up toward 14, again, per 100,000 per year. Uh, the world average is around 10, 12, something like that. Uh, parts, the pleasant parts of Europe, that is Southern Europe, have rates about half that. The unpleasant parts of Europe, that means the North and East, uh, 
have rates that are considerably higher. But in the United States, we've been, we usually hover around 10 to 12 uh, per 100,000 per year, but the rates are definitely going up. And another interesting uh, set of data are to compare uh, 2003 with uh, a decade later, <clears throat> and what you'll see is that in all groups, the rates are going up with the possible exception of Native Americans <clears throat> who have very high rates and may be looking at a, a ceiling effect. But in, uh, in men and in women, in uh, Hispanics and whites and blacks, uh, the rates are rising. Uh, interesting to note here, the general rule about suicide is that uh, men do it more than women. Women tend to attempt more often than men. Uh, black people are among the lowest uh, suicide risk populations, and black females are really at the bottom of the risk range, whereas Native Americans, uh, both uh, male and female, but again, particularly men, uh, have among the highest uh, risks, and uh, whites are somewhere in the, in the middle. Now, <clears throat> another way of looking at these trends in recent years, again, these are uh, published data that have come out recently, making again this general point about the geography that suicide rates tend to be higher in least populated areas. And I don't know whether there's something protective about social density, access to care, I don't know exactly what it means, but generally, rural parts of the country are, have always been at consistently higher rates than urban uh, parts of the country. Here at the bottom, suburban a little less, uh, a little higher, and uh, small town America being in the middle somewhere. And again, in all of these areas, the rates have been rising. So it isn't just a problem for people living out in the Wild West or in uh, isolated areas. It's, it's happening in the cities, it's happening in the suburbs, and it's a general problem. Maybe more alarming than that is the story with kids. And the suicide rate in adolescence has been rising again dramatically over the past decade, and particularly in older adolescents, younger adolescents less, and latency age, kids generally uh, don't do it very much, thank God. Uh, but uh, even in them, there's a hint of a, of a slight increase. But among teenagers, the rates of rise are dramatic and rather gloomy. This is a, a story that you've been reading about in the newspapers a lot recently. It's become a hot political topic. And a lot of the excess uh, suicides in recent times uh, seem to be related to drug overdoses and particularly to opioid overdoses. And we now have some of these amazing wonder drugs uh, that are the, the most powerful opioids ever invented uh, that are now readily available out on the street and are causing lots of uh, overdose deaths. Um, the other part of the story that there's been a fair amount of attention paid to is that there's a, there's a subgroup of folks who are male, middle-aged, blue-collar sorts of people who have a lot of reasons to be miserable, struggling financially, uh, are living in, in communities that are decaying and losing jobs, and just dealing with an awful lot of stress. They drink a lot, sometimes they abuse drugs. And this, this group has been highlighted as being particularly uh, vulnerable, and I think it's a reflection of lots of complicated social uh, and economic problems that we're wrestling with. These are some original data that came out of the uh, Sardinian Mood Disorder Program led by Dr. Tondo, and this is a, an analysis of nearly 6,000 patients that he has evaluated personally and followed uh, since the early 1970s. And by the way, while I'm talking about this, uh, let me make a side remark that he has been able to create the, the most amazing clinical database that I've ever been privileged to work with. 
And he's done it in the setting of a, basically a very fancy private practice clinic type setting with amazingly complete, accurate, detailed clinical records that have been computerized and we can gain uh, access to the data uh, by computer these days. And we've just been spinning off study after study. And the point is that you don't have to have fancy machinery and uh, scanners and you know megabuck grants from the NIMH to do interesting useful clinical research. It can be done in a well-run clinical setting with good records uh, that are kept scrupulously and, and computerized. Couple of important points here. In this uh, database, it emphasizes the point <clears throat> that bipolar disorder is a very bad thing to have with respect to suicide. The it, it, a lot of people in the field argue that unipolar major depression is a very important risk factor as well. And it is, but in a way it isn't. And the problem is that since 1980, we've been defining major depression in a weird way. Uh, DSM-3 was an, a political, I think, amalgamation between old European-style melancholia and what evolved from psychodynamic therapeutics without patients. And all the unhappiness got drawn into one big tent called major depression. So it means that there are people who are really, really, really depressed may die you know, if they don't get some electricity in the head quickly and end up in a hospital. And then there are people who are just unhappy folks who get up, go to work every day and struggle along. And, and the point is that in that range of, of severity of illness, there's a huge range of suicide risk. If you talk about people sick enough to end up in the hospital with major depression, their suicide risk approaches that of bipolar. Again, it's about 20-fold elevated above the general population. But if you work in a clinic setting with folks who are labeled with major depressive disorder, the rates are much lower. They're half to a, maybe a quarter of what they are of hospitalized people or severely depressed people. And again, the reason is that if you're in a clinic setting, not everybody is acutely depressed. I mean, some people are recovering, some people are, have recovered, are doing well. So you have a very, very complicated mixture. Nevertheless, when you're talking about bipolar disorder, and most of these are outpatients, some have been hospitalized too. But there's something about bipolar illness that in itself, regardless of severity or setting, there's something bad about it as far as suicide risk goes. And I don't fully understand it. There may be some hints. <clears throat> the fact that in bipolar one, the risk, these are both attempts and suicides. The risks in bipolar one are probably a little bit higher than in bipolar two, but it's a little more complicated than that, and I'll show you some nice data uh, in a minute about that. I, I do, though, want to make the general point, and in in something I've learned the hard way over the past few years. I, I grew up with the idea, oh, wait, I didn't grow up with it, it was 1970s, learned about this thing called bipolar two syndrome, and my initial impression was the wrong-headed idea that it was kind of the little sister of bipolar disorder. It's not true. Bipolar II disorder is a bad disease. And it's particularly bad for suicide because it's mostly about depression. Depression, depression, depression. And if you're lucky, on a good day, you may have a touch of hypomania. So it's mainly a, it's a form of severe depression which may be complicated by some hypomanias. But it's, a, it's a, a disabling disease, and the suicide risks are pretty close to bipolar one. The other thing that we've been learning about in the last uh, year or two is that this very complicated concept of mixed uh, depression, mixed bipolar disorder, is a particularly high risk condition. And uh, we, we just did a wonderful review of the uh, 
literature on mixed states about a year ago, and the conclusion was that anything bad that can happen to somebody is more likely if you have mixed features. And the mixed features can happen in unipolar and in bipolar disorder. And in fact, things are getting so fuzzy again that I'm beginning to wonder whether we might better turn the clock back to Kreplin and be thinking about manic depressive illness rather than bipolar unipolar. Bipolar unipolar is OK as a kind of a, an intellectual exercise, but it doesn't fit what one sees clinically in the real world all that well. There are many, many people who are in the middle who are mostly depressed but may have some up features in their symptoms, but uh, not enough to call them bipolar. So the, the unipolar bipolar idea, I think, is OK as a rough starting point as an archetype. Uh, but if you, if you remember that in the real world, many people are in between and don't fit one or the other. Now, DSM-4, except for the first time, accepted the concept of mixed state. But they made it so difficult to diagnose that it was sort of a useless concept. You had to meet full criteria for mania and depression at the same time. Come on. It doesn't happen very often. But many, many, many manic or depressed people have stuff from the other pole. I can't tell you how many hours I have sat in seclusion rooms in this hospital and elsewhere with people who are labeled manic and sat with them for an hour and watched their mood and behavior go up and down like a yo-yo. And half of the time, they were demoralized, uh, suicidal, weeping, and moaning. And then at other times, they were, you know, Jesus Christ superstar. So many, I would say almost most people I've sat with who are manic have tinges of dysphoria that are mixed together or quickly alternate. And similarly, we're learning more and more in major depression. Lots of major depression, people have a little bit too much energy, too fast thinking, lots of other hints that look a lot like mild hypomania. Anyway, how you diagnose those and how often they happen and all that, that all those things are still being worked out. How do you treat them is, for me, the critical question, and that's far from clear. But what I've been learning from the colleagues in Europe is the one thing you want to be very careful about is giving an antidepressant to somebody in a mixed state. I mean, you may think that clinically they're mostly depressed because they're miserable. And they make you feel uncomfortable and you want to do something. But it, it can be like throwing gasoline on a fire. And they, these are people who least need more energy and uh, more ability to do harm to themselves. So the warning is, if you are encountering a depressed person who's a little energized, fast talking, what have you, think about a soothing uh, treatment, not an antidepressant. Think about an antipsychotic, a mood stabilizing, at a convulsant, even lithium instead. Uh, and, and as we uh, see here, the uh, mixed bipolars are the champion uh, suicide risk folks. Now, if uh, these are again from, the, uh, from uh, a recent analysis from Sardinian data. And we've looked at uh, the main mood disorder groups, bipolar 1, bipolar 2, all bipolars, and then all unipolars, and the general population. And if you look at ideation, certainly compared to the general population, it's hugely increase in mood disorder people, and especially in unipolars. There's a lot of dark thoughts that go with depression. As far as the attempts go, again, across the board, the attempt rate is way up compared to general population, and maybe a tad higher in bipolar ones, but it's certainly uh, not trivial in the uh, bipolar twos and the unipolars. And the actual suicide risk is remarkably similar. Uh, across these diagnoses. And again, I want to draw your attention particularly to this idea that in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, the risks are similar. So don't get into this idea that bipolar 2 is a lesser uh, evil. It's bad. 
and of almost as bad as bipolar one. Now, violent acts, whether it uh, involves uh, jumping or uh, gunshots or what have you, tends to be a bit uh, more in bipolars than in unipolars, and probably more in bipolar one than in bipolar two. I want to, because of time, let me skip to this last panel. I want to introduce <coughs> a concept that we introduced a few years ago called the lethality index. And lethality index is the ratio of attempts to suicides. So the, the idea is the more attempts there are for a case of suicide, presumably the intent or the method involved is less lethal. In the general population, the ratio A to S is at least 30-fold. And I've seen uh, some samples where it's more like 50-fold. In mood disorder populations, and I, I, this is a conservative number here, 30-fold. And in, uh, in the Sardinian mood disorder patients, the risk is about three times higher. That is, the ratio is uh, three times lower. So fewer attempts for every death, higher lethality. Uh, oh, this is a, uh, uh, Tondo insisted that I include this slide. It's a, an enormous amount of work that was done, uh, uh, published about a year ago in the uh, Acta Psychiatrica. And we did a mammoth uh, review of everything published on suicide attempts by diagnosis. Uh, looked at bipolar one, bipolar two, looked at men and women with bipolar disorder. And the gist of it is that, again, the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two is trivial. It's about a 3% difference, nothing. Whereas the risk in women for attempts is significantly 35% higher than in men. So that generalization from the general population seems to hold up uh, even in bipolar disorder patients. But again, I think this for me is the most important point uh, clinically. That is that bipolar two, again, is a serious problem. Now, the next thing I want to say a few words about is this uh, indoor sport that we call looking for risk factors. And this has been an enormous uh, hunt that's gone on for decades. And I have two things to say about it. One is that there are some clinically sort of useful pithy truisms about risk factors, but not to be taken too seriously. And the problem is that when you try to pin down for an individual person at risk, are they going to do it? Are they not going to do it? When are they going to do it? How are they going to do it? How worried should I be? All that. That's very difficult. So what we know about our risk rates and risk factors based on population samples, groups of people, but to try to pin it down to any particular person, that's where the art comes, and that's where it means you got to know the customers really well and follow them closely. Probably the, uh, the literature is, is most consistent on the idea that the single strongest predictor is previous attempt. It's very high correlation with eventually uh, dying of suicide. Bipolar versus unipolar we've already talked about. Substance abuse, and particularly polyabuse. There are some studies that have found only minor increases with alcohol alone, uh, opioids alone, marijuana alone, what have you. But polyabuse people seem to be at quite high risk. So people who drink and drug, watch out. They're at really high risk. Uh, there are all the psychological and social issues that have to do with uh, loss, abandonment, shame, poverty, stress, strain, and all the bad things that happen in life, that's, these are certainly part of the story. Uh, a big one is that, um, uh, and this may have to do with that map I showed you of uh, Alaska and the Southwest, something about socialized isolation and certainly being alone in life and not having a partner, uh, being unmarried or being divorced, those are all 
factors that are particularly uh, difficult. And I think most especially for men uh, who we know were designed in Detroit, after all, and seem to be particularly vulnerable to not having support. Uh, access to care is, again, probably related to this population density uh, phenomenon. And then uh, people would argue that part of the uh, Southwest and Alaska story may have easy access to firearms and the gun culture and all that. And yeah, it's probably part of it. Uh, but it's not just guns. It's all sorts of toxins, overdoses of medicine, street drugs, and so on. And speaking of toxins, the one place in the world where the general rule that there's a male-female predom predominance for suicide, the one exception that I've ever encountered is China, where more women die of suicide than men, and most of them in a very interesting setting. Most of these are poor, rural uh, women living out in the middle of nowhere, trying to scratch a living out of farming that are in, in, in ways that are sometimes really marginal. And these are women who die of overdoses of uh, agricultural toxins. It's the one exception. In every other part of the world that I've looked at, uh, certainly in this country, uh, Europe, South America, and so on, it's, it's uh, men more than women. Now, and this is another uh, new set of data, and I'm still wrestling with it, and I'm not quite happy about how to analyze it. Uh, but this is from um, over 3,000 Sardinian mood disorder patients. And we looked at risk factors or factors of interest that differed between those who attempted or committed suicide and those who were non-suicidal. And <clears throat> I picked here only factors that were different between those groups by a P of at least 0.01. So these are highly significantly different factors. And then I rank them by the relative risk rate, or the, the ratio of risk in suicidal divided by non-suicidal people. And what you see is a diagnosis of bipolar disorder gets you a fourfold excess uh, association with suicide or attempt. And some other rather interesting factors. Uh, use of a mood stabilizer. Well, you could argue that's just a fancy way of diagnosing bipolar disorder. Who are you kidding? Maybe. But it applies even to unipolars. And in general, unipolars who use medicines other than antidepressants are at high suicidal risk. Antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, lithium. These are people who aren't doing well with standard treatment and are sicker people, probably. Um, substance abuse, hospitalization, separation and divorce, family history of suicide, um, substance abuse. This one I liked a lot. Mixed features, both unipolars and bipolars. Mixed features are tough. Again, mixed features means misery plus energy. And it's a bad combination. Um, other things as you go down the list, smoking, surprisingly. Uh, percent time ill, early onset, unemployment. Uh, another bipolar-ish thing is mood switching, uh, particularly with an antidepressant, mostly in the bipolars. But, uh, and then there are temperament uh, assessments that were done in this uh, clinic. And the general rule of thumb is if you are high scoring in a temperament assessment for dysthymia or cyclothymia, and low scoring for hyperthymia, watch out. You're at increased risk for suicide. And it makes, it makes sense. Dysthymia means chronically miserable. Uh, cyclothymia means emotionally unstable. And hyperthymia means kind of ridiculously happy. So it, it, makes, it makes some kind of intuitive sense. Uh, comorbidity with ADHD was a factor that came out. Having fewer children, having fewer sibs, being earlier in the sibship all mattered. Uh, early abuse or trauma, uh, 
uh, early age in losing a parent. I mean, there are a lot of really interesting factors. Again, these are they're interesting. They're they're clinically sort of useful to keep in mind as you're evaluating a potentially uh, suicidal patient, but they're of limited value to spot a particular person or to say when it's going to happen. And again, the only way to deal with that that I know of is you got to know the patient well and you got to follow them pretty closely. These are some additional uh, subdivisions. It gets a little bit esoteric here, and I don't want to make too much of these things because this is rather preliminary findings, looking at preferential uh, differences. For example, uh, in bipolars more than in unipolars, uh, percent time ill, alcohol abuse, having fewer siblings, more dysthymic temperament, fewer children all seem to be special for bipolar risk factors versus unipolars. On the other side, the unipolar preference uh, goes with uh, if you're unipolar but you're given a mood stabilizer, watch out. Hospitalization, hypomanic features or mixed features, uh, low hyperthymia, uh, uh, the, the usual sorts of things. In bipolar one, bipolar two, it begins to get a little softer because the numbers are beginning to dwindle, but preferential association of bipolar ones, uh, notably anxiety anxious temperament, comorbid anxiety disorder, are much more likely in bipolar ones than bipolar two. And I think in general, I have two things to say about anxiety and bipolar disorder, well, three things. One is it's very much under disorder, especially in bipolar, and I think is underappreciated. We don't really know optimally how to treat it, and, and I've, I've been coming around uh, along with uh, Dr. Vasquez in, in the last couple of years we've written about this, beginning to get very nervous about the whole concept of comorbidity. And I, I may have mentioned this earlier. Um, what, I, what I'm nervous about with comorbidity is that comorbidity is easy to do with DSM 3, 4, 5, because you have a checklist and you can get people to fit into a little box uh, using a checklist diagnostic approach. So you can find people have two, three, uh, four, or more diagnoses. But what does that mean? And what do you do about it? What I'm beginning to think, particularly with substance abuse and anxiety in bipolar disorder, it may be better to think about it as part of the spectrum of symptoms that bipolar people can have. I mean, you know, there are only a finite number of things you can experience or do to have a, an illness. You can have bad thoughts, you can behave peculiarly, uh, what have you. So I, I think that the idea of separating each of these syndromes with checklists into different disorders and calling them comorbid may be begging the question, and I have a practical reason why I don't like it, and that is that each diagnosis begets another treatment. And I really am unhappy and get unhappier every year to see the amount of polytherapy going on. I mean, people on two, three, four. I think the champion was in one of the uh, outpatient uh, case conferences we did in your, in your clinic a few years ago. There was a patient who came in who had been a, uh, actually had been a nurse. And uh, we talked about the medicine she was getting. She said, I'm, I'm being prescribed 15 psychotropic drugs. I said, how do you do this? She said, well, I'm, I'm my own pharmacist. You know, on some mornings I feel like a couple of red pills. Other mornings I take some of the blue ones. You know, I'm kind of doing myself by the seat of my pants. Okay. I hope the residents heard that. So anxiety in bipolar one. Uh, in bipolar two, it seems to have to do with uh, severity. So bipolar twos who end up on an antipsychotic or have been hospitalized, uh, their, their risk is considerably higher. This is another kick in the pants. This is the history of risk 
for suicidal behavior, either attempts or suicides, versus how long you've been sick with a mood disorder. And the sad news is that the median, 50% of the risk comes within the first two to three years. Wow. Why is that important? Well, let me tell you how long it takes to make diagnoses these days. At least we know good data in bipolar disorder. The average, the international average is eight to 10 years from initial presentation to diagnosis and appropriate treatment. Eight to 10 years. If you start out as a teenager, it can be half again or double. It can take 15 to 20 years before somebody catches on. And if that's what's happening and you're being treated as a garden variety neurotic or a depressed person or something like that, uh, you know, the clock is ticking and you're at very high suicide risk way before anybody's caught on to what's happening and how, to, how you should be treated. One other important uh, lesson about time, and we're not the first to uh, get into this, and, and other people have written about it, but I think we've done a, a systematic review of this topic with Dr. Forte about a year ago. And this is a paper that's about to appear on the Harvard Review. And we found a number of technical problems with the older literature. One of the big problems, by the way, while I'm on this, is that uh, I've been talking about suicide rates per 100,000 per year. And I can tell you that if you sample times at risk less than one year, you will generate artifacts. So if you've been at risk for six months and something happens and you report that as risk per year, the number doubles. If the thing happened within three months, you've got a fourfold artifact. So you have to be very, very careful about how you deal with temporally distributed data. The way we did this analysis was we only looked at people who were followed for a minimum of 12 months. So we could, with a straight face, talk about rates on an annualized basis. But here, uh, we did it based on what proportion of the, of the suicidal of the suicidal behavior happened at month one, month two, and so on. And that's what's, what's shown here. And this is a cumulative collection. And when you get out to 12 months, you've accounted for about three quarters of the total. And if you do it more graphically, it makes the point that the risk is extremely high very soon after hospital discharge. This is for psychiatric hospitalization. Worse yet, you know better than I do, the main reasons for being hospitalized these days is either being suicidal or otherwise dangerous. So this is a very high risk population anyway. And the point is that getting out of hospital is a real jolt to the system. In international studies on this uh, problem, I think the clear consensus is that what's missing is a stable, timely, reliable aftercare program. It's a particular problem in this country where our systems are, you know, chancy at best and highly variable and it may be wonderful in this hospital but in many other places it's pretty rough and ready and chancy and unreliable. Even in Europe, even in highly socialized systems where care is basically uh, uh, taxpayer paid for and there's no real uh, barrier to getting aftercare treatment, it's still a problem. And, the, and the, the need to connect between inpatient work and aftercare, I think is a kind of a universal challenge. And I don't think anybody is doing it as well as it needs to be done. The, uh, let me give you another, oh, I didn't, I didn't mention this. One of the curious things that came out of this review on uh, post-hospital suicides is that, oops, um, most commonly by hanging, 
or suffocation in a lot of poisoning. Whereas in the general population, it's about guns by far. Why that is, I have no idea, but it's a curious difference. This is a, uh, a difficult uh, mess, and uh, I have to blame Doug Jacobs uh, for the idea. And in the handouts, you can go through the numbers and try to follow the logic, but let me just hit the, the bottom lines here. The point about post-hospital suicide risk is that it is many, many times uh, higher than in the general population, probably at least 20-fold above general population. That's fine and not surprising, but the surprising thing is that if you compare to clinical samples of mood disordered persons, the suicide risk post-hospital is at least twice as high. There's something special about this post-hospital time. Another shocker, and again, I'll just give you the punchline. Post-hospital suicides account for about 15% of the total. That's a lot. But wait, the problem is, even though this is a huge problem, and even though the numbers are alarming, the next number may cool your enthusiasm. If you go through the exercise of calculating or estimating how many cases post-hospital do you have to evaluate before you encounter a suicide, about 415. And do you get the implication? If you buy my argument that the big problem is the, the reliability and the quickness and the solidity of aftercare, meaning everybody's got to have their sphincters tightened and be on guard and really watching to set up a good solid aftercare program. You know, if you're doing it because of suicide risk, you've got to be a really devoted clinician because it means you've got to go through 400 plus cases before whatever you do seems to matter. I hate to say that, and it's a, a naughty thing to say in public, but that's what the numbers are telling us. And I guess in a way I'm raising that point for a reason. And that is that even though it's a difficult thing to do and even though you're not gonna see a post-hospital suicide you know, every two or three cases, we're still obligated to try to do better and to try to build a much more quick and solid aftercare system, which we don't have. Just to document this, uh, this argument further, this is some uh, recent data from a paper in JAMA looking at the uh, numbers of hospital beds in the United States over time, and it's crashing. Uh, we're kind of getting out of that business. We'd rather spend money building uh, artifacts on the southern border or, or something. But we're not, we're not doing a good job with providing care. And meanwhile, once again, to go back to the beginning, the suicide rate is rising, rising, rising. And if you get to the point that there's something wrong with this picture, I have to agree with you. There is something wrong with this picture. At a time when we should be redoubling efforts to improve the intensity and the reliability of care for people at risk for suicide, uh, we're not doing it, I don't think. And that may be uh, about it. Yeah. And we still have time for a question or two. This is just uh, summarizing what I've, what I've already said. It makes the point, again, that uh, bipolar disorder is a high-risk condition. Bipolar 2 is not much less than bipolar 1. Uh, people with mixed states in bipolar or in unipolar illness are at high risk. Rates are rising across geographic re regions, uh, across population densities, across age groups. Uh, it's really a ominous set of trends, higher in rural areas, but still happening in cities too. Uh, overdoses, especially with opioids, are on the rise and a big part of what's going on. Predictive or risk factors are, are interesting to look at and can be useful as general clinical guidelines, but again, predicting for the individual and when it's gonna happen and so on, very difficult to do. Uh, 
risk factors that have been talked about for a long time and some new ones we talked about, but illness severity, losses, uh, isolation, lack of support, lack of access, access to care, poverty, despair, all those things seem to be important. Mixed states, we've talked about uh, young people uh, are at high risk soon after the illness begins, even if the diagnosis may not come for years later. Uh, Post-hospital rates are very high, but unfortunately the numbers are still, you know, suicide, so the numbers are still small. And again, you gotta look at 400 plus discharges to pick up one suicide, and that makes it hard to maintain uh, a high level of uh, vigilance. Um, but we need to do it. And that's enough for one day. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, from a couple of grand rounds that I've been to previously with you, one of the take homes that I got was that we've been too conservative with uh, about giving antidepressants to bipolar people. Um, but today, um, I heard you say that especially with mixed states, we should really be um, cautious about giving antidepressants to mixed states. Can you uh, sort of help with my confusion there? Let me try to find a uh, path in the middle of those two positions. One of the things that I've learned uh, in working with people in Europe I think I learned earliest and best from Dr. Tondo. Uh, Tondo was taught by uh, the late Athanasius Kukopoulos in Rome, uh, who also had a, uh, a mood disorder program similar to the one in Sardinia. And in that clinic and in the Sardinian clinic, their rule of thumb is that if you are depressed but agitated, highly anxious, sleepless, talking fast, thinking fast, no antidepressant for you. So I think that's the, the, the clinical way to find your way through this. Yes, we probably are too conservative in using antidepressants and bipolars, and yes, we have good evidence that antidepressants actually work in double-blind placebo-controlled trials, even in bipolars, not as reliably, more variably, but uh, if you pick your cases, and you avoid people who are mixed or agitated, then the antidepressants seem to work quite well. Another support for that argument is that for many years people have appreciated that bipolar twos can be treated with antidepressants with relative impunity, because they don't get manic by definition. And the, the fear of, of what happens if you give a bipolar one an antidepressant is it'll blow up and run amok and do dangerous things and, and so on, and, and you might get sued. But bipolar 2s tend not to do those things. Anyway, I, I think this is really a clinical issue, and I, th I think if you try to avoid antidepressants in people who are mixed or agitated, whether the unipolar, bipolar, or in between, you're probably doing the right thing. Thanks, Ross. I have uh, one comment and question. The comment is if the base rate post-discharge is a quarter of a percent, even if we have 90% sensitivity and 90% specificity, we're going to be acting, overacting in cases where we shouldn't be overacting in post-discharge patients and under-identifying people uh, because the base rate's so low yeah. and nobody is clinically 90% specific and sensitive. Uh, and then the question I have for you would be, uh, what's the future of ketamine compared to what we used to think the future of um, lithium uh, what is for uh, preventing suicide? Does ketamine work for suicide? It supposedly works for suicidal ideation answer. anyway. Now what I read in the ketamine literature is it's about suicidal thinking. We're talking suicidality again, my old uh, bet noir. We don't really know if it prevents suicide. I mean, I hope, it, I hope we're on the right track, and I, I think it's probably the most exciting thing that's come along. But we don't have evidence that it prevents suicide, and it only does it for a few days. 
And what about the old literature about lithium being suicidal, uh, some preventive in some ways, or is that just a confound from the diagnoses? Yeah, we're, we're largely responsible for that old, old literature. Thank you. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I would argue that the evidence for, for lithium reducing risk of suicides and uh, near deaths is about as strong as anything around. The FDA doesn't agree. Fred Goodwin and I tried hard to peddle the idea to the FDA to get a, an indication for suicide for lithium the way they did with clozapine. Clozapine made it with one study against uh, uh, Cyprexa. The problem the FDA came back to us with was, well, you know, we said, look, we've got 10 double-blind randomized trials. Lithium always had lower risk. They said, no, nah, not, that's not real data. And we said, what are you talking about? And they said that the suicides and suicidal behavior that you found in those randomized double-blind trials all come out of the adverse event reports. And adverse event reports are passive and incidental. None of these trials was designed to look for a lowering of suicidal risk, so get out of here. This was around the same time that they were on their witch hunt with suicidality in SSRIs and kids. So double standard, I, I guess. But what I'm saying is that the, the evidence is pretty solid. On the other hand, I just uh, a couple of months ago reviewed the latest CDC data on overdoses and fatalities. Uh, a decade ago, lithium overdoses were rare. And their suicide risk on overdose was similar to that of modern antipsychotics at the SSRIs, quite low. Last year's data are much more ominous, and lithium overdose death risk is somewhere in the middle of the pack. I mean, it's not as bad as the old tricyclics, but it's worse than modern antidepressants and antipsychotics. So I, I've been cautious about not overdoing this idea that lithium is some kind of easy magic bullet. I think it can be helpful if you're following the patient very closely and you feel that they're pretty reliable people, not, a, not highly likely to impulsively overdose. But it's, it's no panacea. And unfortunately, it and clozapine are two of the most difficult drugs to use. And they're drugs that tend to have clinicians hovering and praying that nothing bad happens. And that may be part of the magic. I don't know. But yeah, lithium looks promising. And I'm hopeful about ketamine. But uh, from, from a pointy-headed academic perspective, uh, it's about ideation short term at this point. So I'm, I'm mindful of the time. So I, I think we'll, if you don't mind taking questions, maybe after. So let's have one last round of applause for Dr. Baltrini. Thank you very much.